So now with business, with business people, what this means is when we're talking to people about our business, when we, when people are going to our websites, they are like running on treadmills at that moment in time. It's exactly like that. So if you are not trying to give people what they need, you know, like you said perfectly, like the base human things to help people survive and thrive. Hello and welcome to The Real Success Show. I'm your host, Candice Mama. If you want to know how to be an efficient storyteller, then today's your episode because I'm speaking to Marlon August about how we can start telling better stories about ourselves and our brands. But before I jump into it, be sure that you are liking, sharing, and subscribing so that more people will find us. Now, here's Marlon. Marlon, thank you so much for being on The Real Success Show. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much, Candice, for inviting me. Really excited to be here and to have a chat with you. Looking forward to this. Amazing. I'm so looking forward to our conversation. But for people who do not know who you are, Marlon, how do you walk into a room and introduce yourself? Uh, well, I think it depends firstly on what hat I'm wearing, because, um, you know, we all have our various interests. But generally, um, I'm, I'm a marketer. Um, I help brands sort of better communicate, help brands simplify their messaging and sort of build the, the, the right context around themselves um, so that people can buy their products and they can grow their business um, from a professional side. And uh, if I was, my, another part of my life is, is, is very much entrenched in sports. So um, I, um, as, as, as a, I'm a two-time Olympian, so in that space, it's, it's, it's really, and, and I work out, um, I'm, I'm at, a, at a club, I'm the chairman of a club at Tux. Um, so, so, you know, they're just like, yeah, we, we breed champions and, <laughs> And we go for, we try and get people into the Olympic games and, and uh, being African and world champions. And that's, that's, that's me. <laughs> oh, I love that. I love that. And I want to actually speak about both branches of who you are. And I first want to start at that Olympic level, right? Because we all know to become that kind, to compete at that level, rather, there's a very particular kind of mindset that you have to have. So when you were preparing and competing how did you prepare for that uh well I would say what we did a lot was just constantly train we practiced it over and over and over again um there's there, it's really it, the, you get quite a high from being in that space and um being at that level and um, and, and it's really, it's, it's really about connecting with people and, and testing yourself the whole time, um, that are going to beat you the, down. The whole, the whole purpose is to, is to smash the other person and, and, and these guys just want to eat you up. And it's just like, I'm not going to be eating today. Today I'm doing the eating. So it's so, so really about putting yourself in that space. So to, to really, for, for me, it was always just trying to be my best, trying to be the best person I could possibly be, trying to overcome. And it was, and, and especially um, was to, it was also it's a, another way it was escape, you know, an escape from this other world for me to be able to really dive into who I am and better myself. Mm. And which world was that, man? And which world were you trying to escape from? <laughs> the, the boring world of, of, of uh, normal life. I think sports people are like crazy because you, you, you constantly trying to push yourself, you know, to run faster, push harder in the gym. Um, when it comes to competing against, in, in judo, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an individual sport. So you, you're competing against someone else all the time. So you're always trying to beat someone. Um, so it was, so I guess it just allowed me to get away from normal life, which was bulls and, um, I don't know, relationships and, um, all these other things. Whereas there I was just like completely with, with judo, it's just really, it's just you and your kimono. So it's really stripped down to the bare minimum. This is, I just need me and I just need to just 
keep focusing on this. So it, it, it was just, I, I think that's really what I was running away from, just all these, the complications of life, I guess, and just bring it to simplicities. And, um, and, and it was all this one focus of just being the best version of myself. Mm, I love that because I think it's so true. You joked and said, athletes are crazy and I think the beauty about uh, like athletes or people who really perform at the highest level is a singular focus right like your life becomes still and you just zoned in on one target but the problem yeah. with that is because you're so zoned in on one target everything else can start falling apart because you're like as long as I get it right here everything else I'll figure out later so how do yeah. you manage to keep other parts of your life functioning while you were so zoned in on achievement? I think it was a few things. It was it's support. So um, I was lucky enough to have um, family that really understood the goal um, and were in, in on it with me. It wasn't just a decision for myself. Um, I was, I was also very, I'm also very lucky to have now my wife, then my girlfriend, who was also a highly supportive of, of me being, not being around, um, of us running a business, uh, you know, cause, cause you know, a highly underfunded sport. So, uh, especially in Africa. So we, we, so you have to put in all the money and all the finances have to come out of your pocket and having to run a business and still be able to be all around the world was quite complicated. Um, and, and have to manage these things while, you know, the, some, whoever didn't pay rent and, and, and then I'm like halfway and like around the world, a different time zone. And you wake up in the middle of the night and you're seeing that and you're like, oh, how's this going to get paid? How's this going to happen? And you're like, oh, no, I'm supposed to focus on being here and being at this competition, you know, the, like all those types of things. But it was beautiful to have different people around you that that support that su that supported me throughout the whole thing. Um, and um, I think that just is the main thing, having the right people around me and everyone, they, they, they were so supportive, um, for, be it friends, be it um, family, everyone was like chipping in and, and doing their part to, 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 to go, because we, we didn't go to the, I didn't go to the Olympic Games myself. I literally had to ask, guys, what do you think? <laughs> and everybody was like, eh, let's throw this around a bit. And from there, we actually made a decision. Wow, that's incredible. And I think it brings me back to that saying that, you know, you become like your environment. It's so important how you, the people you choose to be in that space, because you could yeah. have had people who were like, nah, nah, dude, stay home. Let's go get a normal job, you know, and we'll figure this thing out, you know, so that's incredible. And so coming back yeah. to, you know, the craziness that was happening during that time, we are living in a pretty crazy time right now the past two years now going into three a lot of people have found themselves in a place and space mentally that they've never ever been before when you were dealing with your own chaos how did you manage to mentally stay focused and mentally stay in your life without getting consumed by the external noise the beautiful i think this is where goals really come in um it's just so so just to talk about now versus then um so now we had there was that breakup of the olympic games i wasn't trying to compete now this last olympic games but we had uh we had some some ladies which was also awesome for the first time um qualifying for the olympic games and was like the first there were no men just ladies and they were doing they were really doing their thing it was really awesome and then they had that that period of time where nothing happened and then one of the ladies had fallen off the the the, the journey um but one completed and I, and, and throughout that whole time, we were constantly trying to keep them engaged. What I found was like, it was the, the one that, that, that drifted away. It was because her, her vision changed. She, she stopped focusing on the immediate goal and started focusing and started making other things important. For me, it was always throughout my I wanted to go to the Olympic Games. I had that stuck in my brain since I was nine years old. No, I was 11. And um, my coach had spoken to me about Olympic Games and that thing stuck in my brain. I wanted to go to the Olympic Games. And I just had that vision all the time. 
And, and, and I just kept on staying focused on that no matter what I did, no matter what came into my life, it was always that we we're always talking about it. Um, so the goal was really, really important and staying focused on that goal, no matter how hard the road went, because many a times I was traveling alone, many a times I was, um, and it's very hard to go when you are w competing against people who have professional teams, they have, um, medical staff, um, psychologists, all that stuff with them. And then you're by yourself. It's just me and my ace and literally on my backpack and I'm getting in there and, 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 I, and I've got a budget and like a very tight budget that I need to stick to because this is a three month journey, a three month trip this time round, you know? So, and injuries is in sport is happens. So you have to manage those things very well. So while all of this is going down and then you still got to deal with this mindset, with this mind that's constantly telling you, I, I don't know, I think you must just not do this. <laughs> Maybe let's not train today. Let's just relax, you know, and, and then you got to remind yourself, dude, you, you don't have as many options as these people. You got to put it in now. Um, constant reminders like that. So it was always knowing that I've got another competition and that was also beauty of sport because we have a competition, competition, competition coming up and, and you just keep focus on just the very next thing. What's the very next thing? What's the very next thing? And, you know, when having that focus on the, while we had the, the visions, the big goal, what are the small steps in between that? They, these competitions, so stay focused on that. And then I just need to be one little bit better tomorrow so that I can be better when this, when this milestone comes. And that's what made it hard coming now into COVID because all of a sudden we don't know. It's like, whatever plans I make, it doesn't even matter, you know? So it made it really hard for certain people, but to keep certain others engaged, we had to say to them, well, it doesn't matter. Tomorrow we're training. Tomorrow we are focused here. Um, the whole country is on lockdown, but you don't worry. We, you got, we got you doing training. So that was, that was, I think that, that was the biggest difference. And it's just, I think the biggest difference is goals, focus, and, and just what do I need to do to get me to the next step? Mm. I love that you actually touched on the fact that even once you were at the Olympics, that you still had that mental chatter. I think so often we assume that once someone achieves or gets close to achieving their goal, that the fear goes away, that that mental chatter goes away. And so mm. for you, how do you define fear for you and in your life? Oh, fear. So it's so the the chatter actually got, got louder closer to competition and closer to <laughs> me reaching what I was trying to reach. Um, and 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 for me, I always knew that when whenever stuff like that happens, it means I must be close. It must be close. So I tried. I tried to always. And, and that was the thing. I never really achieved what I wanted to achieve in sports because I didn't get the gold medal at the Olympic Games. And uh, I had a few other tournaments that I never really got where I wanted to. And I realized, especially now looking back, that um, that fear was, was still well hidden. But what I noticed was, um, well, how it appeared for me would be, it would just be... Hmm. I'm just, I'm just trying, because I know what the, the, I know what would end up happening is I would be disengaged. I would like, I would, I would drift away from, from, from certain things. I would procrastinate and, and start to, you know, have wandering eyes. And especially like when it came to, when it comes to judo, judo is like wrestling, like um, it, in other words, you have to weigh in. Um, and because you have to weigh in, you have to be very diligent with what you eat and what you consume because every gram counts. <laughs> and when you, what, what happens closer to competition time is that people would be, we would stop eating, basically stop drinking water, all, consum all consumption goes down to nothing. And if I'm starting to now look at all the goodies that I need to eat, I know that I'm losing my focus. So, so I'd have to really, that would be like some of those indicators for me that, dude, you, you're, you're, you're feeding into the wrong thing. You're feeding into the fear. You're feeding into the icons and it's starting to 
you're starting to look to the sugar, you're starting to look to all these other things to fill the space, um, even watch too much TV to fill the space because you, you can't be with yourself and, and, and you can't focus on your own goal. So that, those are the indicators to me that now fear is starting to get into my way or sometimes I just switch off completely, like um, disengaged, not communicating, um, and those are things that would tell me. So the, it would either, and beautiful thing about having a coach, he also would reflect that back to you. Um, and, and Marlon, you, you're drifting, you know, and I, okay, I'm try and get myself back there. Yeah. So I, I hope that answered the question. It does. It does. And I think it's actually so beautiful because I think it happens in every part of life, right? Where you listed all these things that tend to happen, the drifting, the looking at things outside of ourselves to escape ourselves. I think that's really mm. what you're saying. It's like looking to just escape this feeling of uneasiness, of fear, of you know, being afraid that you might not get what exactly it is that you want. And I think that is so powerful. You mentioned your coach. When you are in coaching, so I used to run in school, so definitely not at the level you were competing at. Um, but I remember that mindset was always so reiterated. And I think the coach trained you physically, but even more so, they had to train this up here because if this is gone, then the rest of the competition is gone. So yeah. upon that stage in your life, is that when you started realizing like, or learning certain tools and skills that you are now using in your current business? 100%. Um, it's very interesting because I'm still working with that same coach today um, with the newer players and, and the younger ones. And he's, he's from uh, Bulgaria. So he's got a very Russian mentality around things, which is very crass and uh direct <laughs> and the the thing about him is that he'll tell you the truth he'll tell you exactly where you're at and why you're there and the fact that you should just get out of it immediately and and those were always that was really important and really 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 good because today um you know i can have i can have better conversations like that with myself um, so, so it, it was really pivotal and, and so much so that today when we're talking to the younger ones and he's having this conversation where he's telling them off, I just totally get what he's saying, you know, because I could see it from, I could see myself literally play out in them. So yeah, it, it, it's, it, it became having that person to, re I think it's one of the most important things, having the right person reflect back to you, the things that you are feeling that you are doing that you can see they can see your emotional state they can see where you're at and feed it back to you and if you can be constructive enough to take the right lesson you it's it's so it's so pivotal so important and do you have any routines or you know uh, habits that you do today to keep you centered and grounded yeah um so i love to meditate i i love i never used to meditate I used to find it so difficult, but now I, I love to meditate. Um, it's it's one of the it's one of the it's my saving graces. Um, it's I find it's one of those things that actually helps me with focus because you have to just think about something and you're trying to hold a thought for periods of time. It it takes it's an it's an ability to focus. So a lot of that um, I enjoy. I also enjoy doing like breath breath work. It's quite a lot of fun too. Um, I realize like people don't know how to breathe. I didn't know how to breathe. So so breathing is and 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 especially when it comes to stress, um, understanding how to breathe can change everything. Um, it's funny when people are, when 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 tensions are high, we tend to hold our breath. And I, I didn't notice that, I know that about myself until like it was brought to my attention. So I had to be like, wait, I am holding my breath. I'm clenching my jaw. I need to just, if I breathe, it just becomes easier. So I, I do a lot of breathing, breathing work and, and, and I, I like to work out. So <laughs> when I work out, the stress goes. So those are the things that I use quite a bit today to, to just keep me, to keep the maintenance up. Mm. I love that you were speaking about, you know, meditation, that initially you didn't like it. And now it's like your saving grace. And that's exactly what it is, right? I think yeah. it was Deepak Chopra who said, uh, if you 
in your day, you should meditate for 10 minutes a day. And if you do not have 10 minutes, then you should do it for longer because yeah. then you more. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, yeah. brilliant, you know. Um, and when you were speaking about breathing, I think that is so deeply important because we do hold our breath, right? We, so we breathe to survive and we don't actually breathe to be centered and in our bodies. And when you start learning, mm. you're like, oh, wow, is this how people feel? <laughs> I've been carrying the world on my shoulders. <laughs> so, you know, a funny story. So a funny story that, because especially at the moment, I'm, I'm playing with something. and. Um, so, so basically it's where you tie uh, a shoelace around your stomach because we live in the aesthetic era. Yeah, something like that. We live in the world of aesthetics, right? We must be, and we, it's all about the, the, how we look to our eyes to, you know, we must look good to feel good. Um, and one of the things that was very interesting is that, um, so what people do is that they pull in their stomach so that they can appear thinner. And I was like, but that means that they're also not breathing out. They're not breathing, you know, to the, they're not breathing out because when you breathe out properly, you'll breathe out and you push your tummy out. And then I realized, wait a second, I'm doing that. I'm literally, I'm literally holding my tummy. In. <laughs> and, I, and that's what it became. That's why I, I like tie the, the thing, this, it, it lets because then when I've, when I've sort of got my belly expanded then it's then it's to the limit of the of the of the lace and I was like that is a very interesting thing it was I because I didn't even think it was I mean I'm I'm in shape and and I do that so I was like that that is very interesting it's so it's so deeply ingrained in us that's a great story I didn't even think about it and even now as I'm sitting as soon as you said it I was like am I <laughs> Exactly. Like sucking in. Yes. <laughs> I was. I was. <laughs> just, yeah, it, it, it is fascinating. It's fascinating. Wow, that is so cool. And so coming into you teaching people how to tell their own stories, how did you end up branching into that? Um, yeah, so I, 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 I was always involved in marketing. Um, I had to fund my judo career. So um, I worked in a family business. I didn't really like school so much. So um, I had to work straight out of school. Um, and, uh, and that's how I, 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 I worked. Um, I started doing some marketing and then I started really enjoying how to market. Um, and, and from there, I moved to um, eventually um, after the 2016 Olympic games, I started a, a marketing agency learned how to code and stuff and started building people's websites. And, and that's when I really got involved um, because well, one of the things while I was traveling, I still needed to make money. Um, and, and what my wife and I did was we started a business that I started marketing overseas while I was marketing overseas. I was like, okay, I need to learn how to do this internet stuff and, and learn to all that stuff. And, and then I started to realize like how important um, a narrative is how important it is to share a message um, and later after 2016 built an agency didn't really like that and decided I wanted to get I want to get better at at helping people sort of form a strategy around their messaging because what I found is that most people they I mean a lot of people know how to build a website a lot of people know how to um, send emails or or really put ads out on Facebook, then maybe they don't do it well, but they can do all those things. But the problem, but what all of that, what makes it successful is actually the narrative, the story we tell, and whether it actually connects with the people that we're trying to communicate with. And that, like, it's not necessarily copywriting, but it's like an element of it. So I, I started to understand where my position is in between the strategy and the, the actual um, copy. And then I was like, and then I went to, to the United States um, and studied with a man called Donald Miller who wrote the book, Building a Story Brand. And he's got an awesome framework that he uses in, in, to, to be able to tell stories and decode stories. And uh, I, I created that to, I used that to create my consultancy and from there, started using the framework 
to build stories for people because if this is and this is where the thing is most businesses they they understand yeah i need i need to get my, my the word out there but really how do you do it how do i tell these stories that actually engages how do i tell these stories that is still simple and allows people to to really understand my core offering but not necessarily just talk all about me because that's what people do we start talking all about ourselves i'm the cheapest i'm the best <laughs> and and people don't want to hear that they want to hear how you're going to make my life better um how's your product or service really going to change my life and that's where i started to focus in on on on, on that and help people to form that narrative for themselves that's incredible and in your journey what have you found has been the most misunderstood thing about storytelling so storytelling is not necessarily just this once upon a time thing you know, not all stories begin like that or end like that. It's telling stories is also, and this is the beauty of, of having to learn some sort of a framework is that you get to learn that all stories, no matter how they are, they, if they follow a certain pattern and when you, and you, when you got the pattern, cause there's no, there's no story that doesn't start or doesn't really start without a problem, right? You know, there is always a problem. And when you can get, clear on what that problem is, you can then help someone um, move towards a solution. And you, you say, okay, well, this is, this is the best way to, well, number one, you got to figure out the problem. Number two, when you know what the problem is, you start to figure out, you start to connect with the people that can help you figure out that problem. And then three, you work together to, to solve the problem. And once you got that, you'd get, you connected with the right person, and then now you don't have the problem anymore. Now you, you're onto a whole new level. Now you become a whole new person. So, so you, you show them the benefits of what the life is like after the problem is solved. So most people don't do that. Most, most businesses, they end up just talking about their products and services, um, how cheap it is, how, um, better, how much better service they have. And that everybody's doing. It doesn't set you apart, but if you can talk about how it benefits people and how they can, how the, how much different show that transformation in the content that you create, it just it positions you better and it changes the way that they think about you and they'll remember you. Uh, the memory, the memory of it is so important. As you were speaking, I thought to myself, isn't there a way to use what you teach? for individuals could people listening to this like do this for their own lives marlon 100 percent, 100 percent. you know it's funny so I, I was having a conversation with um a lady they also they run a consultancy and it's more around like staff engagement and things like that and she was she was telling me and we do it conversationally she's like well the problem is that da, 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 da. and so that's why we decided to create this product because um, we realized how disengaged people were, and then we did these studies. So it's like there's a problem that got me there. And, and essentially, we go through our entire lives like heroes of our own story. And then when we wake up in the morning, there's some problem that we feel we need to overcome, right? <laughs> so, so if we just really just mimic life um, and, and just pay attention to those things, by the end of the day, when we overcome that, and, or, you know, this is literally how we can do it in our own lives. Um, we just pay attention to our own stories because the things that we've learned that we've had to overcome in our time went through that exact same process. And, and we just love to see it over and over. This is why awesome movies do what they do. They attract us in that way. And they all follow, follow that exact same formula. So yes, 100%. It makes me think of uh, is it Joseph Campbell who wrote yes. The Hero's Journey. And, you know, yes. he speaks about like, you know, the hero starts on this great voyage. And then of course he experiences his first obstacle and then he like goes and all of us, this is all Hollywood movies, right? But the yes. truth is we don't stop going to the movies just because we've seen Denzel Washington's going to survive. We, yeah. we just like, I'm, yeah, I want to know how he survived, what yeah. the problem is, who the villain yeah. is. And I love that. And so yeah. I, I know that with brands, uh, many times human psychology is such a major part of that, right? Because when you are wanting to sell a product, so many people don't think of it as like, you have to cater to the base human needs. And that's why we usually sell using like 
you know, beautiful woman or like, you know, a great car because people are like, oh, if I buy X deodorant, I'm going to end up with a supermodel subconsciously. <laughs> yes. yes. If X yes. did that blatantly, we'd be like, what are you saying? But if you're doing it through subconscious messaging, then that's what we are being told. So in terms of conditioning and mindset, when you are creating stories, how much of that actually like comes into the equation? Uh, big time. So there's two problems with the, the, not two problems. There's two things that the human brain does above, but above all else. The first thing is that we try and condense, we try and it, it erases things. So the brain at the whole time is trying to just take things out because we're just trying to live our lives. We're just trying to be normal people. And there's just too much of stimulation in the environment. So the brain is literally just erasing a whole bunch of things. The problem with that is that it's doing a second thing. At the same time, it's trying to conserve calories. So now with business, with business people, what this means is that when we're talking to people about our business, when, we, when people are going to our websites, they are like running on treadmills at that moment in time. It's exactly like that. So if you are not trying to give people what they need, you know, like you said perfectly, like the base human things to help people survive and thrive, you're gonna, they're going to tune out and they're gone. Um, today, websites is one of the biggest ways that we can communicate our message to people. It's the easiest way. And when someone, you got three seconds to capture any new attention. So three seconds, like goldfish is literally just appearing and disappearing. And, and we just don't have the time. And if your website is like, is, 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 you know, we are great. It's just not, you're not going to capture anybody. You got to tell them exactly what you do and how you're going to help them survive. Um, and, and that, the, so it, it comes into everything. Um, I have this analogy that says, imagine every piece of information that you give someone about your business or about your brand is like an eight pound bowling ball and it's slippery and got Vaseline all around it. You know, how many of those bowling balls do you think you can give someone before they drop everything? You know, th th literally that is how we got to think about our information and think about the information that we share about our business because people just want the stuff that's going to help them survive and thrive. And if we can't help them do that, they're going to lose, they're going to tune out, they're going to, they're going to go to the next thing that they can understand because that's where they buy. People don't buy great products and services, they buy the stuff that they understand the easiest. It's literally that simple. Jeez, and three seconds, that is... Three seconds. <laughs> wow. Like when you think yeah. about it, like, and I, as you were speaking about it, I was trying to explore my own buying patterns right in terms of like am I captured in three seconds and it's so true if you move on to a website and it looks like it was designed on WordPress in 1988 it's like you can barely fix your website I am not trusting you with my money <laughs> exactly 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 you know and, and another element is also repetition you know we, we actually downplay how many times we need to repeat something for people to understand this is why the big brands actually win. You know, X does what they do, but you've seen that message so many times. Yes. And then here's a small business trying to compete with that. And you, you don't have the spending power. So how are you going to compete? Mm. Wow. Repetition. So you, you have to be clear, clear, and then repeat it over and over again. <laughs> Jeez, a repetition is so underlooked, right? And when you were starting um, the interview, you did speak about the fact that you, when I asked you, you said you have to train, 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 and train, right? Like there's no getting around it. Like, yeah. And I think now in advertising, it's a very similar concept. You've got to do it, do it, do it, do it. And eventually people will do it, like will follow through on an action because I think I'm also that kind of consumer. I can see an ad a million times and not do anything. And then I just need to see it a million and one times. <laughs> and all of a sudden I'm like, you know what? I don't know why it's a strange thing. Why am I craving Coca-Cola, right? Exactly, <laughs> exactly. And it's so weird because sometimes you might be watching TV and you, you get it. And then, then you get this message somewhere else and it catches you. But then one day you're walking past a store and then that, it, it's the familiar, it's the familiarity that, that hits us, right? All of a sudden it's like, I know you. And when I know you, <laughs> we're friends.
friends. And when we're friends, there's a very good chance I'm going to invite you to dinner. You know, we're, we're going to do, we're going to get to the next level. And, and that's, and that's what, like, when, that's what about putting our brands in front of people, communicating with people. That's what it's really all about. It's building relationships. And, and when you can get clear on that, not, and, and, and not try and skip those steps, you know, be familiar and get into their world, communicate in their language, and then you, you start to invite them into a story instead of telling them one, and then it becomes, then it's our story. I love that. I absolutely love that. And I'm a firm believer that in today's day and age, now that we're moving into the metaverse, uh, you know, every single human being is a product. Every single one of us, whether we want to or not, if we have chosen to have social media profiles on any platform, they don't really belong to us. They're an advertising agency for who we are as individuals, because everyone gets to come onto your page and just make snap that three seconds, ah, this is the kind of person Marlon is. Ah, this is the kind of person Candace is, right? So mm. in that world that we've now stepped into in a big way, how do people start controlling the story that they're giving to the world? I think, I think the first thing is just a bit of clarity on, on, on who you are and what you want to sort of bring out there. Um, I, I think... Too many people, um, they're not really clear on who they are. And I think those are one of the main elements. Um, and, and understanding who you are and, and, and how you want to project yourself is, is, is so important. It, we, I had a session just before this. And that person's really great at what they do. The problem is that they, they, they want to do it all. You know, they, they want to... They want to help the corporate. They want to help this person and that person. I can do that. It doesn't matter. I can help more. But, you, but really, you, you may be able to. You may be able to support all those people. But is it likely going to happen like that? Um, you know, go for, be focused in the approach. So I would really just get really clear on who you are, um, how you want to serve the people you want to serve, and what are their specific problems that you can help based on who you are, you, that you can help them um, solve, you know? So that, that is where I would look at it and, and really say, okay, hone that messaging down, hone that, that target down into that, into that space where you, I, like, I know what I represent or who or what I represent, and I know who I want to help. So now I can ma marry these two by communicating to these specific problems through who I really am um, and how I'm uniquely positioned to solve those problems. So th those, and, and the only way you can be doing that is really through specificity, as much as you can to a degree. And then later on when, I mean, once they become a client, once then they, they'll, the pods will open up into all the various different things you want to do. <laughs> uh, th that would be my suggestion. I think what you're describing is the fact that we live in a society of plenty, right? It, for the first time in history, we have these little digital devices over here that allow us access to everything. There's very yeah. little that you cannot have and have in absolute abundance, right? You want to date, you go on to Tinder, it's like a million people. You want to have food, there's like a million options. And I think yeah. that sinks into our psyche of like, but I want to do it all, you know, because like there's so many options that are constantly being presented to us. And, yeah. you know, and so when we are looking at, you know, brands, or we're looking at storytelling, or we're looking at, you know, how we position ourselves in the market. All of those things have like a core central message, right? The core central theme. But in your experience, what is, if you had to take one thing from storytelling, what would it be? Problems. If we, if we if, and, I, and I guess I've spoken about it already before, but I can't, the thing is, if we stop talking about our customers' problems, they stop listening. People, as human beings, I mean, I, I think, uh, I, often I think of uh, Robin Banks because he, he, he talks a lot about, you know, like, like you'd have these two ladies and they'd be talking about something and they're just, what is he talking about? Of days of other people's lives, right? And he mentions that. And 
I think that's funny because we are, if you hear people talking about someone and you know that person, your ear is going to tune in immediately because we are tuned to understand and, and, and focus on problems as human beings. So if you can figure out what those problems are and you can communicate to them, I think you're always going to have an ear. So regardless, and people like to get it confused between, well, it's, it's, whether it's B2B or B2C in terms of um, you know, business to business or business to consumer, you're still communicating to a human being. So if you can be communicating to their problems in that institution, in that organization, then they're going to pay attention. So I would say that's that number one thing. Focus on the problems, get really clear on it. Sometimes, I mean, some copywriters, they, they do amazing work with identifying the problem and then they'll make the problem worse by making it super real, you know? Um, and, and, and you're like, oh yeah, that's my problem. Oh yeah, that happens. And I can imagine that happening because all of all these three problems just sort of stacking up. And that's, you know, the movies or the roller coaster that we kind of get these emotional roller coasters because that's literally what happens. We, 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 we watch and like, oh no, oh no, oh no. Jesus is not stopping. And that, that type of thing is, is what draws us in. So problems, focus on people's problems. I love that because it, I was interviewing John Tellerico. I don't know if you know of him, but he is no. a professional networker. So his thing is I can connect you with anyone on the planet. The only thing is you need to have a strategy to solve their problems. And so I always found it so interesting because he says so many people will say, I want to know Oprah. And he's like, but what are you bringing to Oprah's life that another million people aren't bringing? And yeah. so sometimes it's about studying the person that you want to meet and then fixing or initiating a way to make their problems less, you know, problematic. And I, as yes. you were speaking, I was thinking about that. And I was like, it's so true. Whether it's even in dating, right? Like when you are coming into a dating situation, problems, right? Like in terms of, obviously no one wants a negative person. <laughs> like don't be out here like, uh, uh, but, uh, <laughs> but I, I think that the biggest bonds come from like, this is your life right now. And this is how I'm going to fix this problem of this. Yeah. And when you can trust yeah. someone to be able to make your life lighter instead of heavier, that's when you invest in them. And I think that's across mm -hmm. the board, right? I mean, how many people have you met that they say like, I'm a problem solver? Um, a lot of people consider themselves like that. And the, the, it's because they're also looking for the problem first to solve. So I think intuitively we do that and it just makes, it, it really just makes sense to, to figure out the problem we solve and then support people um, in solving that problem. Mm, I love it. I love it. Marlon, I can't believe we are getting to the end of our time together. But before we do, I want to ask you, what is real success to you? Real success. I love that you're asking me that question now. It's the end of the year and, you know, been reevaluating a lot of that um, in terms of what is my, what is success? You know, what's the vision and all that, all those good stuff. And, and really success to me is, is real, is about, am I happy? You know, I, lately my wife and I have been asking this, ourselves that question. Am I happy? You know, um, because things change. We're living in this world where everything just changes. Um, so it's really about just being happy right now, right here um, with craziness, with um, beauty and all the happiness that's ha all the stuff that's happening. Am I happy? Um, so it's really success is for me is happiness. It's enjoyment of, of the moment as much as possible um, and really just being of service um, to the people that I love, to the people that I want to um, be in my professional world, the, my friends and my family. And uh, those are the things that really make me happy, being of service, um, um, being there, being, being the person that, that I want to be, like the, the, that I want to see out there, am I living it? So um, when I evaluate those things, I think those are real, that's what real success is. Oh, I love that. I, and I love that you still questioning it, right? I think everyone should 
still be questioning continuously as to whether or not they're still in alignment with what they consider as real success. So I love that answer. And the final question is, what is something about you that we will not find on Google? Something about me you won't find on Google. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, there's quite a lot actually because <laughs> <laughs> there's not much on Google about me. But um, I think that I, I I really I love yeah you want you might find it on Google. I I really love Africa and I love everything that we represent. I think Africa. I was thinking about it today. We've got there is something so special about this continent um, that we bring to the world and i'm so looking forward to the next few years where well continuously but i think there's so much that's going to come in the next five ten years out of africa that's going to blow the world away um yeah i'm in love with this continent and i think we got so much to bring i love so that, that <laughs> love that <laughs> now you will um <laughs> <laughs> yeah maybe <laughs> Oh, Marlon, it has been such an honor and a privilege to have you. Thank you so much for your time. Oh, thank you, Candice. It was really awesome spending time with you. Thank you. That was an incredible interview. We know that you love being a part of our family. So please be sure that you are subscribing, hitting that notification bell so that you always know when we upload. It has been an honor and a privilege to serve you this week. And I look forward to doing it again next week.